work that we did with Clark County to basically try to achieve a data-driven approach to prioritizing location for new and enhanced crossings across uh, unincorporated county. The goal is of the program is to automate identification and screening of the highest need locations, really serving the expressed desire to optimize financial resources and staff time for reviewing and installing crossing treatments. But let's start by backing up one step and really what we're, I'm gonna go through the next 20 minutes is starting from the standpoint of what the context was for the county and their approach to safety and active transportation for where we got to the point of developing this prioritization I'm going to talk about an evaluation framework. This is kind of the what the metrics and methods for actually scoring locations to identify higher priority or lower priority locations. Then I'll talk about kind of the nitty gritty of a tool that was developed to help facilitate scoring and then kind of what it looks like to what that tool consists of and how it's operated. And then lastly, bring it back with some lessons learned, which is otherwise known as the lead into questions part um, and go through that. So start, talk about context. And I think it's a good way to just start from the standpoint of actually the mission statement for Clark County and how the way that they're approaching transportation. So mission being uh, trap and engineering section is to ensure reliable transportation infrastructure that provides for safe and efficient movement of people and goods. And so really there's gonna be a through line throughout this of thinking about safety and how do programs get developed that can be in service of safety, looking at it in this case from the sense of pedestrians. Um, within the set of programs that Clark County has developed, there's a set of kind of six goals that they see as kind of overarching framework for how they think about transportation infrastructure. So for safety first at the top of the list, and then we'll see kind of objective, consistent, consistent, cohesive, kind of a long list of terms, really looking to have that through line of creating processes that are replicable, replicable and also follow established guidelines. So really trying to build a structure that works year to year to year to year and understanding that, you know, this is a profession where uh, more things change, more they stay the same, but really what we wanna think about is having something that's consistent so that when the answers do change, we have a clear process that allows us to identify why recommendations change or how conditions may tip us over to choosing a new treatment at a specific location when it comes to safety. And so what I'll be talking about is the pedestrian crossing prioritization program, but this is one of a set of eight different programs, um, some of which we've had the benefit of getting to work with the county to develop, um, some other ones that they've developed kind of on their own or with other consultants, but this is really just bringing it that this is one piece of a larger approach um, that the county has really done a great work to developing. All right. So when we first started having conversations, Kittleson and Clark County, especially, I just want to also give a real shout out to uh, Ijaz Khan and Courtney Berman, who really a lot of the detail and thoughtfulness about the tool and kind of what the prioritization ended up looking like really came from a great interactive um, process of us working with them and them working with us with great feedback. So if you see something you really like, there's a good chance that they, you know, have a lot of credit for where we came to. But when they when we first started having conversations, what they came to us kind of with a desire was they wanted to improve safety and mobility. That's you know pretty broad, but generally rep, like important goal. And then also in responding to increased pedestrian demand in the county. Where it got more interesting was they had a goal of really trying to develop a criteria that was going to inform uh, both their own work and also guide developers. Um, uh, to basically inform things like, well, what triggers would change a new type of treatment to be appropriate location? Um, what considerations should they as a county be looking at when they're trying to determine where the best uses of their dollars are? And what requirements are there from just an engineering standpoint of the appropriate treatment for different contexts? Now, like final thing that they really wanted, they drove home for us is they really wanted to look countywide. Um, Clark County um, and the unincorporated areas really ranges from rural farm areas to you know, relatively dense uh, commercial corridors. And so they have a really wide gamut of types of 
locations and conditions from you know trail crossings in more forested areas to a crosswalk near a school in a you know denser residential area and so they wanted a tool that had the flexibility um, to help support a, to a approach to actually thinking about the county as a whole and prioritizing dollars countywide not just you know segmenting and attacking different you know isolated locations throughout the county all right, so I'm going to try to be clear here. There's two actual components of the pedestrian uh, crossing program. What I'll be talking about in more detail in a moment is the pedestrian crossing prioritization program. But I also want to just highlight the work that uh, Clark County did with HDR to develop a pedestrian crossing treatment policy, which is really much more focused on looking at specific uh, conditions at a location, whether or not it's the type of control um, school proximity, speed of volume, speed or volume of traffic, and really saying, well, what is the appropriate type of treatment for a isolated location? So really, that's more of a location focused where what I'll be talking about is a little bit more of a screening process for looking at the county as a whole. So kind of a big picture, where should we be looking to put treatments? And then um, the pedestrian crossing treatment policy is really the, okay, we've got a location. What is the appropriate treatment? All right. So first, I'm going to talk about the framework that was developed. And so framework is the word we've used for it. But I think another way to think about it is just how do we score locations to identify what is a higher priority versus a lower priority location? And so within that, um, really thinking about a range of factors for considering what makes a location a good location for thinking about enhanced pedestrian crossing locations. Where we kind of came out through conversations with the county was identifying pedestrian demand. So what are characteristics associated with greater pedestrian activity? Um, connectivity and accessibility, we like to think of that a little bit more like where are the important network connections. So maybe a trail crossing someplace that's gonna like draw people to a given location. Um, and then we have crossing risk, uh, not to be confused with safety. Crossing risk, where we try to separate these out, crossing risk being more what are factors such as higher vehicle speed or higher volumes that are associated with greater risk for someone who is crossing versus safety was really a crash driven. So looking at over the last several years, where had there been crashes involving pedestrians? And then lastly, there's just a bunch of additional site considerations that are not captured by the screening. These are things where you do a site visit or even just look in aerial and see, oh, there's something unique about a given location that may not be captured by either spatial or demographic data. And so leaving space to really think through, well, what are the other things uh, an engineer or planner should be thinking about when they look at a given location? So now what you see is a kind of table that was developed to give different scores to different components. Um, happy to kind of come back to this later, but there's a couple I just want to like highlight. Um, so one of them is really at the top. This is within the demand and thinking about from, I think what can sometimes be thrown into the catch-all of equity, but really thinking about what are our vulnerable populations when it comes to walking on the road. Um, and so things, what we, one of the major components was the transportation disadvantaged population index, which is used by the state of Oregon in multiple contexts to really capture where based on residential uh, demographic data, where are there populations that are either more likely to be walking or more vulnerable when they are walking. We also, what was really important to the county was also thinking about low income job density. So this is pulling from data from the Census Bureau around job location. I know there's often it is easier um, to have equity metrics when we're talking about demographic data that are really focused on residential because that is how a lot of census data is set up. But it was important to really also think about well, where are um, people working is there can be relatively high income locations where there is a higher concentration of workers who may be more likely to walk or take the bus um, or other kind of situations where the workers do not match with the residential population in a given location. I think the other one I mentioned just a moment ago is really emphasizing that crossing risk versus uh, crash history that you know crashes involving pedestrians are rare, uh, obviously not rare enough. But what that means is from a you know, data perspective, not letting um, a, setting up a methodology that chases crashes and instead thinks, well, what are the situations where a crash may incur involving an individual? Hey, Alex, before yes. you continue, are you sharing your screen? I am. I thought I was sharing my screen. Can you not see anything? We are not seeing it. Oh, no. Get there. Okay. Okay. Let me try this one more time. 
So far, the slides haven't been that interesting, so we're okay. Now Can you're you see sharing. it now? Yeah. Okay, well, less in my face, probably a good thing. Nothing up to this point has been uh, overly critical. Maybe just take a step back here to see um, just the table, which I was talking about a moment ago, of just what are the inputs that were identified. I'm gonna confirm one more time. You can see the table. Yes, we, I can, we can now see your uh, table and screen. Okay, great. No problem. Thanks for, thanks for stopping me. All right. So there's a bunch of different components of the score, thinking about the different factors. Um, really highlight again that there's a number of additional site considerations that were not considered as being part of the direct scoring, the screening, but which, you know, is that flexibility of identifying the specific context for uh, why a treatment may be considered, why a score, you know, a score is there to help us uh, facilitate a review and it's not the end all be all. We wanna think about things like redundancy. Is there a crossing, you know, less than 250 feet away that is the appropriate crossing or um, are there specific design or cost considerations? One thing that was brought up was there's a number of roads that are curved and having curved roads near crossing may lead to site considerations that need to be identified and thought about before treatments are put in place. All right. So where this then came to is a really prioritization methodology. And this is where we spent a lot of time actually iterating with the county to identify the right mathematical equation to pull this data together. So if we thought about it is we want to prioritize the locations where there's more pedestrians or more demand where pedestrians might want to cross if there was a crossing available. And then also, well, where is their risk? And then also thinking about well, that where have crashes occurred? I think one of the really seems, it seems somewhat obvious in hindsight, but took a while to get to and really important to emphasize is we're trying to emphasize locations where there is crossing risk and where there's demand. Um, where if you separate them out one or the other, we were doing, a, you know, that does a pretty good job of identifying high-speed arterials, but are, is, is there actually land uses that would be such that you'd expect people to be crossing at those locations? Or similarly, a you know interior, interior crosswalk inside of a park. Well, there's a lot of demand there, that's great, but is there really much crossing risk rather because vehicles are traveling really slowly or there are not many vehicles? And so now I just give a kind of like, a little bit of a taster of what the screening process and tool help to do is really to give a framework that allows for identifying and scoring across a very large geographic area. So um, in the end, the tool when applied in Clark County identified about 8,000 locations. Um, most of those are not good locations for a crosswalk and maybe seem very obvious, but the idea was to have this countywide approach uh, looking at both intersections and mid-block locations. And so really where this is trying to take it is having a consistent framework, which I've now presented and getting to a manageable number of sites for review. It is not feasible to drive around the entire county. It is manageable to identify you know, 100 or 50 locations and do a more detailed review of those locations. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the tool and the screening process. So big picture, um, the tool is part of a screening process. The screening process is a process that you know, has been set up for the uh, county to basically use available geospatial or demographic data to provide a high level score to different locations. And then to the tool is there to help score the locations and then facilitate review of sites. And so what that looks like, we'll get into in a moment. All right, so the tools uh, that we you know, developed really consists of two separate parts, a crossing screening tool, um, which is run an arc map as a toolbox. And its goal is to automate the task of basically relating spatial inputs. And the critical reason why we used ArcGIS, both because it's powerful, but also because this is data, some of the inputs do change on a fairly regular basis, whether that's crash data or um, geographic uh, distribution of people or jobs. And so being able to have a system that they can continue to update on an ongoing basis. The second component basically takes an output from the toolbox and we're able to paste in a spreadsheet of data into a scoring spreadsheet that basically has a bunch of preset calculations and drop down menus to help do a preliminary scoring and then facilitate and staff members review of individual locations. 
And why we use these, it's the whole process wouldn't necessarily need to use these tools, but what we found is GIS is really powerful for doing that spatial analytics and Excel is moving everything into Excel then allows for a broader number of staff members to really work with the data review sites and have a kind of common, more widely used uh, tool that people can actually interact with. ArcGIS is um, rightfully somewhat scary and can be a little finicky. And so we wanted to have as much of the interactive component of it really be in Excel. So what it looks like, uh, I'm gonna go relatively fast through these steps, but happy during the question and answer to kind of go into more detail about them. Um, so the crossing screening, you basically click on a toolbox, it pops up a window and then basically finding the data that relates to all the separate inputs. So what you might have noticed by this point is that Clark County has a lot of spatial data that is relatively robust. And so we were able to make use of like the wide range of data they had from number of lanes to traffic volume um, to a database of the existing crosswalks that they have. When you click OK, tool runs um, and spits out a consolidated uh, table of all the, or I guess a shapefile, consolidated shapefile of all the data put into a single um, database. So for every point that was tested, we actually have a, a full database of all the different variables that we use in the screening process. Okay, copy that table, paste it into the Excel file. And then the Excel file does kind of some, I would say magic, but it's not particularly complicated, actually just applying the math of the framework to estimate or to give a preliminary score to all the sites that were reviewed. And this is fed into a cleaner interface that ranks the sites based on their top score. We also split it out by the different components of the score to give a sense of what's driving a site to the, be higher or lower. And it actually does it for all the sites reviewed. Um, Initially, we did it for a smaller subset, but one of the things that the county was interested in having access to was the ability to review sites that are recommended as part of um, input that they're receiving from the public. So being able to say, you know, we've gotten requests for a safety concern at this site. How does it score relative to other sites we know are already a problem? And then either they're saying, no, we recognize that there's issues at this site, but we know we have 15 more locations that are even higher priorities than this and being able to actually create that framework of thinking about sites um, as they get requests and being responsive to the public so that they're not having to do, basically doing a lot of the legwork to be able to be responsive and thoughtful. And then what also is in the spreadsheet is allowing for drop-down menus at the, shown at the top where you'd be able to select for specific types of locations. And that was added for thinking about grant applications that it might apply to a very specific context. So a grant application for being near schools, um, for instance, being able to select for all the locations that are within a certain distance of a school. Um, so then what the tool is set up for is there's that kind of clean, simple, you know, screening. But then there is a separate tab that then allows and facilitates review of individual locations. And so it's a much kind of honestly much wider, wider sheet in the spreadsheet. But what it has is it has the individual score for every component of the framework, as well as an option to basically override that value based on an individual site review. So if you see on the left of the screen here, it's the ability to kind of look in our, you can basically cross reference from the Excel spreadsheet to ArcGIS to look, well, where's this location? Identify the location and either plan a site review or you know, Google Maps overview and review, well, how do, how do the scores actually look? We just you know, recognize that spatial data is imperfect, um, whether that's due to inaccuracies or just complications about a site. Um, for instance, like schools in particular, there's gonna be access points at different points in the location around a school. Um, how a specific crossing location fits within the actual access points may change a school presence from being really close to a given intersection to actually relatively far if the school's you know, reassigned and really focuses into a different location. So as a user does this review, they can use the drop-down menu to basically rescore specific components and then review how sites get re-ranked. So basically able to do your site review and as you're doing the site review, you work within the Excel spreadsheet to rescore you know, individual components as is necessary. And you know, our findings is that really wasn't that necessary, but when it did happen, it could have a relatively large impact on how a site either popped up or popped down the rankings. 
So you then see the rankings. And then the last component of the tool is basically an option to select with the dropdown whether or not a site wanted to be considered as a site for potential implementation. And when those sites are identified, they were basically moved on to the final sheet of the workbook. And in that sheet, the site was pulled up with some basic information about the site. And then based on uh, the guidance in their design handbook, a specific recommended treatment was identified for that location. Uh, then if there's crash, crash history involving pedestrians at the location, a benefit cost ratio was calculated to give a rough sense of the scale of the potential benefit of implementing a crossing there. And so just lastly, I want to leave with a, some lessons learned here. Um, so first, to talk about data. Um, this is definitely with all these tools and screening process. The uh, classic rule of garbage in, garbage out certainly applies here. And so success is really built on comprehensive and well-organized GIS data. And it requires diligence about updating and addressing inaccuracies. And, but I think the part that was actually most interesting to all of us involved in the project is it also helped building this framework and thinking about a, systemic, a systematic way of evaluating sites, push the conversation around what new data would actually be useful. I think it's really easy to get trapped into the cycle of, well, let's find as much data as possible, more, 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 more. But instead of having, well, what do we actually need? What is not captured by the data that we have and what is actually needed? So out of this conversation, the county did decide to do a little additional review for identifying characteristics of their existing crosswalks. Um, then from a process standpoint, um, screening, the screening process and the tool itself are used to support a detailed site review. Um, the tool is not an end all in and of itself. Um, it's really just there to support regular update and to have a function that provides for the opportunity to make uh, adjustments as necessary. And then in a larger picture, uh, it also is a process that is like adaptable, yes, for pedestrian crossing, but is adaptable to other contexts. So for instance, uh, the county has done something very similar um, for their guardrail program. So bringing in spatial data, having a ArcGIS tool to run and put all that data together and then review um, specific sites. So with that, I just say thank you very much. Apologies again for not showing the slides at the beginning, but I think we got the important ones and really appreciate this opportunity to talk to you and happy to answer any questions when we get to that point. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, we will be doing the Q&A uh, after Anjem and just uh, for everybody here, you can uh, either put that your questions into the chat, or there is also the uh, official Q&A feature um, that we'll be utilizing as well. With that, um, thank you, Alex, and handing this off to Anjim. Thank you, Brad. Uh, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes, uh, I can see your screen and it looks great. Okay, thank you. Let me just start for a second. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Anjum Bawa and I'm a principal transportation planner at Farron Beers Portland office. Um, I'm going to be talking today about how we can use um, both traditional and uh, non-traditional data to make better and more equitable decisions uh, regarding mobility solutions and amenities at station areas and uh, within the neighborhood, and uh, solutions that fill unique mobility gaps for the community. Um, very similar to how Alex just showed about using various forms of data to hone in on the solutions and priorities. I'm gonna try to do the same way uh, for uh, mobility hubs and mobility solutions within the neighbor neighborhood. Um, Right off the bat, when we think about making infrastructure investments, um, uh, we, we want to have a high return on investment goals and objectives. And it's really uh, important uh, to uh, choose the right type of data so that uh, we can develop solutions, especially important uh, for uh, goals and objectives related to climate or equity. Uh, and so typically, when we approach a, a transportation infrastructure decision, uh, we're traditionally gravitated to uh, uh, the uh, forms of data that are 
either multimodal counts. These include roadway intersection uh, counts, transit ridership counts, bike and bed uh, counts. Um, we often use data from the travel demand model, uh, which could include traffic projections, mode split information, origin destination data. Some more commonly used uh, demographic data uh, can be very helpful um, and typically used. These are employment and population information. And many times we would also use a, a detailed scan of network and spatial features uh, at the stationary just to assess what and where services can be accommodated. However, to really customize uh, solutions that are unique and equitable, we must look at uh, more granular details of the community. And this could include demographic information about income, age, race, and ethnicity, uh, English language uh, proficiency. Um, it could be active transportation connectivity, um, um, such as connectivity index analysis or LTS or level of stress uh, analysis, um, looking at clusters of prominent destinations like large employers, entertainment users, educational institutions, so on and so forth. And then um, input from community is really critical. Uh, this input could be equity focused to really identify the unique needs that the community has and the solutions of the gaps uh, that remain that cannot be met uh, with the, the, uh, the current uh, mobility framework. And then um, another uh, set of data that uh, is non-traditional and can be very helpful is psychographic profiles. Um, I'll talk more about the use of this data in the following slides. Um, I'm actually gonna be talking about two projects to show how we use this uh, more traditional and non-traditional data, both in combination to come up with some of the solutions. Uh, the first project is um, a stationary and new mobility element suitability analysis that we did as part of our work on the Southwest corridor, station area, urban design services from TriMet. Uh, we work closely with uh, Jeb Jordan and uh, Fiona Kundi at TriMet. Um, and uh, we were working as part of a larger team uh, with VIA, ZGF, uh, Mayor Reed, and um, many others. But our focus was on the mobility solutions uh, and the analysis around that. And the second project uh, is the more recent uh, equity mapping and suitability analysis. Uh, that we did as part of our work on the emerging technology implementation plan for Metro. And uh, we were working closely with Elliot Rose at Metro uh, alongside Alta, who was leading the project. So I'll start with the first project. Uh, the Southwest Corridor, for those who do not know, uh, is a proposed max light rail line uh, that would provide a, a 30 minute trip between downtown Portland and to Alton. The line uh, is proposed to have 12 stations along the route. Uh, and at this time, the project is on hold until uh, funding is identified. Um, the voters declined on the measure uh, in 2020, but so the funding is still on hold. Um, and so I'll just focus on the work that we did there. We initiated our work on this project with a key question from TriMet about the need to plan uh, for mobility hubs along the route. To answer this question, we first started um, with a critical assumption that every station area is a mobility hub. However, every community is unique and the type of mobility solutions and the package of amenities at a station should be customized to meet these unique needs. So for purpose of our uh, assessment, we looked at uh, suitability for the following three uh, categories or three buckets of mobility solutions. Uh, number one uh, was micro mobility. Under this uh, bucket, we looked at uh, the conventional bike share, uh, docked or dockless, e-bike share, e-scooter share. Uh, number two was microtransit. Um, this included on-demand shuttles, uh, neighborhood circulator shuttles, a potentially autonomous uh, transit. And then um, under the third bucket, car share, this included services like uh, Zipcar uh, or on-demand ride share services uh, provided by Uber or Lyft. So as part of our suitability analysis, we looked at um, key demographic characteristics, um, including total population and employment, proximity to transportation infrastructure and services other than the transit line, ease and comfort of access on foot or by bicycle, uh, disadvantaged population, uh, land use density and mix of uses, and potential for future growth around these station areas. We mapped quite a few demographic characteristics within the half mile of the station area. These included key origin destinations uh, adjacent to the station area, type and scale of land uses, number of jobs, 
population, age, race and ethnicity, income, income levels was a, a key one. Um, and there were many uh, more, including terrain, English proficiency, et cetera. All of this information helped us tailor our recommendations of mobility solutions to the population around the station, considering uh, physical ability, financial ability, and the need to serve equitably. To better understand the perspective of a private vendor, whether they would be interested in uh, providing uh, their services in an area, uh, we uh, used our own proprietary micromobility market suitability tool. Uh, using this tool provides a spatial analysis uh, that approximates suitability of urbanized areas for shared micromobility services, considering land use and transportation factors, as well as entertainment, tourism, education destinations. The tool highlights areas with high, moderate, and low suitability. And you can see that on the image on the, uh, uh, on the slide, uh, on the map on the right side, which shows red, which is high suitability, and green is uh, low suitability. This is just a snapshot of the tool. And uh, this tool can be applied nationwide um, and, and uses some common uh, inputs uh, that I mentioned above. Again, this provides a perspective on the question of would micromobility providers uh, see the stationaries as a good deployment opportunity? To gather more granular insights on the traveler, such as spending habits and technology use, um, level of education, we obtained psychographic profile data for households located within one mile of the station area. The psychographic profile data is grouped by characteristics such as household size, education level, job types, and spending habits. This data overlaps quite a bit uh, with demographic data, but uh, what it gives us is a more complete picture of a household. Uh, unlike uh, demographic data, you, you get one piece of data and you have no correlation of what other uh, things are around the same household. Psychographic profiles provides clusters where households may have similar spending habits or similar demographics and could uh, uh, favor one mobility solution over the other um, and it's used to connect to transit. We then map the psychographic profile data around the station areas. Uh, you can see the station uh, areas marked uh, in the image in the maps uh, with a black border. Um, we did it for all 12 stations. The slide shows two heat maps from our analysis. Uh, on the left, uh, the map shows cluster of um, low-income senior population with several other common demographic, uh, financial and psychographic characteristics. On the right, the map shows cluster of very low-income households. Each map highlights the need for a specific mobility solution to connect the cluster better to the transit line. And it also shows that how, uh, with a heat map, how some stations you could focus on a certain type of solution or the others where it could be less used. For example, for a low income senior cluster, an on demand uh, or neighborhood sh shuttle could be a better solution as opposed to a bike share. And if you see a lot of that cluster around the station area, that would be something that uh, could be focused on. Using our systematic analysis of demographics, psychographics, suitability, we then developed a matrix of recommendations identifying which of the mobility solutions had high, medium, low demand at each of these 12 station areas. Another thing that we did uh, uh, do here was identify which solutions that TriMet should focus on keeping on the station area property, or uh, also identify solutions that these are really important solutions, but they really should be provided uh, within the partner agencies right away, whether a sidewalk or right away that uh, the agency owned, uh, there's Tigard or Portland, um, but uh, that these were essential. For example, the slide shows a page uh, from this concept uh, design report, which summarize, uh, summarizes our recommendations for 30th Avenue uh, station with specific demographic data highlighted uh, where the numbers are relatively higher or lower compared to other stations. Um, we also um, show the recommendation here right, right at the bottom. Uh, I zoomed in on the table, which um, identifies where you would have a medium demand or a high demand or low demand, which is um, identified in yellow and light green um, of services that may not have adequate 
uh, demand at the station location. So just really focusing on the ones that uh, will make the most sense and will give the most return on investment uh, on the objectives uh, and, and the others that uh, will need some uh, assistance uh, from public uh, funds uh, to really create a, a, a scenario where those would be more appealing at a later time or more development around the station that could uh, result in those mobility services um, uh, becoming more in demand. So shifting gears, a second project I wanted to highlight today um, is our recent work on that, um, on the equity mapping and suitability analysis for Metro Emerging Technology implementation plan. The project is still ongoing, but our work was finished. Um, so I'm able to talk about it. <laughs> the implementation plan is a, a next step from uh, the research and analysis uh, completed for Metro Emerging Technology strategy developed in 2018. And the project will recommend specific guidance and actions in leveraging technology-enabled mobility solutions at a regional and a local level. Again, we started off on this project with framing uh, the questions really clearly uh, in a concise way. Uh, on the equity mapping, we uh, wanted to uh, know where are the clusters of historically marginalized communities and other vulnerable population in the metro region. We wanted to know where are the uh, where are there gaps in mobility services in the metro region? And then what areas in the region are hotspots with um, high concentration of HMCs and vulnerable populations uh, with the highest need for mobility options and services other than a personal automobile? Under the suitability analysis, uh, what we wanted to know was what areas are likely to be considered suitable for emerging technology deployment based on the land use, key destinations, and network uh, connectivity, what areas are most likely to benefit from the development of technology enabled mobility services. For the equity mapping, we uh, started off with um, a metro equity focus area data, uh, which included um, data on population that is low income, non-white and limited English proficiency. Typically these areas represent 150 times or 150% of the regional average. And the map on the right shows it, uh, a map that we had uh, prepared as part of the analysis. The map uh, shows the block groups that meet one or more of the criteria. The darker the shade, more criteria it meets out of the three. Out of the three. So you can really focus on where you, you see the highest equity need. Um, and we also looked at other demographic characteristics in addition to what the Metro data looked at. Uh, this included disability status, zero vehicle households, detailed race and ethnicity data and mapping those out um, and then senior population to name a few. So the, for, the, for the purpose of our suitability analysis, we focused uh, uh, very similar to the Southwest corridor. We so focused on the five mobility gaps uh, and, and thinking about the associated solutions that could fill those gaps. These included a non-motorized first last mile gaps. Uh, these are short trips that could be filled with solutions such as conventional bike share. Uh, motorized uh, first last uh, three mile uh, gap. These are uh, mid-length trips and could be filled with e-bikes or e-scooters. Uh, we looked at multiple uh, passenger shared ride vehicles. These are microtransit van pool services. Uh, number four, uh, fixed base car share. These are potential partnerships with Zipcar. And number five, ride hailing programs. These are public private partnerships with firms like Uber or Lyft. Again, to analyze the suitability, very similar to the process in Southwest Corridor, we used a weighting score, uh, weighted score method to um, evaluate influencing factors. And some of the influencing factors, uh, and, and they were different for each of those five different uh, types of mobility gaps. Uh, these included good bike connectivity or not, high bike facility density, population density, job density, um, and destination density, uh, density mixed uh, or commercial uses, presence of frequent transit stops, uh, terrain, uh, average trip length. Uh, this information was from the model data. And then large employers and educational institutes that uh, was uh, pretty influential in some of the decisions. And then uh, high model trip density. So in thinking about some of these uh, influencing factors, um, we, we scored each one of the, um, the different um, mobility gaps or the solutions essentially across the whole entire region. 
and, and identified block groups that scored really high versus block groups that didn't score high and they were not as suitable. So for example, on the map on the right uh, that I show, uh, it shows uh, the analysis for a fixed base car share, um, more like a zip car partnership. Uh, we looked at factors uh, for fixed, care, uh, fixed base car share, um, included high population density, high job destination density, high mixed uh, commercial or multifamily use, um, presence of large employers or educational institutions, or, or uh, frequent transit stop within two miles. Once we had our suitability mapped, uh, we then overlaid uh, the equity, uh, the EFA layer on top of this to really hone in. And I'm gonna kind of flip back and forth to show uh, how the equity layers uh, in and, and which are the um, block groups that have the highest need uh, of, from an equity and a transportation perspective but then also have a, a suitability for mobility. That really allowed us to hone in on the, um, uh, the block groups that we wanted to um, identify as the, the candidates that are primed for any kind of uh, technology deployment. Um, and uh, with at least one mobility option uh, with a medium or high suitability, um, we also incorporated uh, a lot of the input that we received um, during our stakeholder engagement uh, and, and the equity tax uh, task force. Um, the equity task force was uh, conducted by Anita Yap um, and uh, really um, then putting all those candidate um, areas or neighborhoods uh, within these four quadrants. Uh, on the top left, you have the high equity uh, and transportation needs and high suitability. And then on the bottom right, uh, we had um, identified candidate um, block groups or neighborhoods that uh, that were kind of low equity needs and transportation needs, and then also didn't uh, meet the suitability uh, threshold. So that's how we uh, assembled um, our uh, decision making process. And uh, this these two projects just kind of give you a flavor of some of the the data that we used and. Uh, uh, some of the process and the method we used in identifying um, areas where we could do uh, make investments uh, from an uh, equitable standpoint that are uh, that are much needed and also meet the suitability um, threshold. With that, I'll end my presentation and happy to answer any questions later on. Great, thank you, Anjum and Alex. That was, uh, those were both very thorough and um, I'd like to say I learned a lot about data collection today. Um, as people are writing in their, their questions and and gathering their thoughts. Um, I thought I'd throw one out um, to, to each of you co collectively, which is um, a, a, little, a little bit more general, which was, um, you know, uh, you're looking at a lot of data, you're looking at it from a very, this, you know, literally at times, like a lot of just dots on the map and, and that can sort of like get lost in, in, in in, in how in how the uh, um, how it's you know what happens practically and I know that we go out and we have a site visit and we look at every intersection um, and, and every area but how would you say that um, how much of that affects how much of that looking at it from such a high aggregated level um, makes it easier, more difficult, more surprising when you actually are looking at something standing, you know, from that human perspective, standing on a corner saying, how do I cross the street? How do I get on this bus? How do I access this option to commute around? Yeah, I'll, I'll hazard a first answer. I mean, I think, and I hope this came through in our pres in my presentation, I think really when we talk about tools, I think our approach when kind of thinking about tools has often been 
um, recognition that those are two different experiences, that they just, they are different experiences and that the goal with developing tools or kind of technology, the emphasis that we like to place on is in the um, reducing the burden to do that high level informational review to make sure more resources can go towards, I think the things you just described, Brad, which is, you know, community outreach, going and talking, experiencing, you know, doing an event at a school where you're actually looking at travel patterns. And so the goal really with the tool and the high level data is to answer the kind of simple questions and allow you to really target the resources, target more resources, frankly, towards that kind of like hitting the pavement, talking to people type work, which is really so critical to doing a good job when it comes to these types of investments. Yeah, uh, and I totally agree with that, Alex. Um, one of the key challenges um, to thinking about what solution really covers uh, um, the full community and the needs of the community uh, is to first of all, uh, find the right data uh, to answer those questions. Many a times we found that our, our solutions are so myopic because uh, we haven't considered other data to really sharpen uh, our pencil on some of these uh, recommendations that we come up with. So especially around equity, um, you know, informing yourself with whatever data and data that is like trying to tell a story, a narrative about households that will use your services and how they uh, will use your services. I think that is critical. So, uh, you know, framing the question, what are we really looking for? And then really then thinking about what data can answer those questions and bringing different perspectives is a key key aspect, and I think the most important aspect uh, when you start. And, and then once you uh, start on a path with with your data and your questions and your approach, then it's just kind of following the process of the method and come up coming up with solutions. But the solutions will always just reflect the kind of data that you looked at. So I'll just stop there. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. And for um, all the attendees, if you'd like to ask a question, um, not typing, but speaking, uh, just raise your hand and uh, I can give you uh, the ability to, to ask the question directly. I know that that might be easier, especially if it's um, you know more of a, a complicated question for our panelists. Um, there was a comment uh, to us about um, while people are considering those questions. There was a comment about um, budget and just to um, put that back to you and discuss a little bit more and or maybe expand on it. Um, you, you know, in a more general sense, uh, some of this is, is some of this about uh, having this data and analysis a better way to prioritize limited budgets or to in some ways um, find find more ways to, to um, you know, really make, you know, how broad does that go? Is it about shrinking the budget or is it about making the budget as, you know, as complete as possible to meet, to meet the goals of, of uh, what was studied and, and, and the desired outcomes from it? So I, I think the answer to this can vary, I think, but generally, you know, my, I can only speak to kind of the experience I've had that the emphasis has not been, okay, how do we make this more efficient so we spend less money? The, it, the recognition is that want, there is a, you know, leading from a standpoint of we want to improve equity with the dollars that we have, what is a way that we can do more good with the dollars that we have or make the case for more investment because we're able to do more with what you're able to provide. And I think with data, I think the part that is really tricky and really goes context to context is recognizing whether or not a tool is appropriate for the data that's available. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a recognition of like understanding the data sources that you have and their relative strengths and weaknesses. So um, for instance, I'll just use a, a, a good example here is that like census residential data, which is often home-based data is used for a lot of these equity metrics that are kind of proliferated in the last you know, several years. 
and they really focus on home location. But I think we're seeing, especially with the suburbanization of low income populations, that really is a missing, you really miss part of the story when you're looking only at where people live and not looking at where they are traveling to during the day or where they need to have consistent, reliable access. And so to bring that back together is really just sometimes there's going to be cases where data really can allow you to make a certain part of the process more efficient, but it's also recognizing there's times where, you know, you just put your thinking cap on, you talk to the people that are out there, and the way that you improve the process is being more thoughtful in how you do your community outreach and not trying to invest money after money into improving a uh, tool that, you know, does the thing you could do by just talking to people. And so I think that's the part that's, you know, honestly, it's just really hard to figure out which direction to go on any given project. I'll just uh, quickly add to it that a lot of the data that we used was essentially kind of free or already available. We just had to source it. Um, uh, th this data is um, you know, out there. I think the only data we paid for is psychographic profiles. And that's not a, a huge amount uh, when you compare to some of the uh, money that uh, sometimes can be spent on just doing uh, manual traffic counts, uh, which are pretty expensive at an intersection. Uh, so. Uh, data is uh, getting uh, cheaper and cheaper to uh, purchase to help make these decisions. And the good part is it's out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, thinking about a little bit of that creativity of, you know, yes, this is usually a consumer uh, uh, data that is used by shopping centers or whatnot to know uh, a bunch of households uh, around a community. Uh, what uh, kind of spending habits they have, whether they have access to a cell phone, but they're there are pieces in that data that can actually be uh, repurposed to actually make, help just make decisions about transportation and how they will engage with uh, uh, different mobility solutions. So um, I will make that point. And I, I have another question here um, uh, about how granular we can get. So um, although we had anonymized data uh, from um, the firm, uh, I'm thinking about the psychographic profile data, uh, that can actually be very, very granular down to the household. And you can kind of get it uh, within whatever radius uh, uh, we, we analyze using, um, summarize using block groups, uh, but you can go larger than that. You can go smaller, uh, fo focus on, uh, you know, a, a block, a city block and think about oh, some of the trips that are being made out of the block or into the block uh, using um, some big data tools and also thinking about uh, psychographic uh, clusters and, and how some of those um, income levels uh, related with other characteristics can all kind of tell a story about what would be uh, more suitable um, uh, down to the, even the housing complexes level. Thank you. And that's a, that's a, Great, great question. Um, we're coming up on to wrapping up our time, so I don't want um, anyone have any of their last minute burning questions um, to ask for our fabulous panelists here. And I'll give you uh, just a moment to to uh, raise your hand or, or get that into the chat. Um, before we close, I'm gonna ask each of you to just give some, uh, any final thoughts as, as we close out here. Um, and, and so, uh, I will, uh, since, since Alex kicked it off, um, I'll have him go first and just any, any closing thoughts on, on what you've heard today and, and, a, and a big thank you. Yeah, first I, just, I want to say thanks for having, making this space available to kind of get to reflect on this work and also, you know, here, I get the opportunity to hear some great projects as well. Um, and I think just the last thing I want to just note on is we're coming to a new future when it comes to data. And I think just thinking something that Anjan just Jim says, just said was just thinking about what is available. I think we, for a long time, we spent a lot of money on providing data that's internal data sets versus these publicly accessible data, where that's government or private. And I think just it's important to really start thinking critically about the different data sets and their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, especially when it comes to some of these um, like LBS or like cell phone data is like, what are you getting? 
understanding their strengths, their weaknesses, when do they make sense to use? When are there things that you really don't want to have your hands on individually identifiable dots? Um, I think there are some companies that are starting to sell stuff like that. So it's an exciting time, but just when we talk about these tools and data, just be critical and thoughtful. Alex, you put it really uh, well. So I don't want to repeat uh, stuff that you said, but I'll just uh, add that, you know, there's, there's um, a lot of momentum uh, about using different sources of data to, uh, to solve transportation uh, planning problems. And uh, um, this is a great, uh, this has been a great uh, venue to share some of my experience and learn more about what Alex is doing and uh, learn about so much more uh, that is happening in the industry and just, uh, you know, almost drinking like uh, from a fire hydrant here. <laughs> uh, but so thank you uh, uh, for putting this together, uh, giving uh, me, uh, our firm, and everybody else involved in the opportunity to share our thoughts. Thank you. Well, another uh, thank you to you both. And uh, I just want to thank all the sponsors of today's events. Those are listed on the conference website. Um, thank you to all the attendees for um, your participation today and enjoy the rest of the summit. Take care. Thank you.